What's up, fellas? This is Dennis Sperling. I'm coming live to you guys again from Dennis Sperling Unfiltered. Look, 62% of black men have entered into the middle class. And for the most part, uh, if you guys are going to have children, your children, if you come from the hood, you come from the ghetto, you come from the projects, you come from a little country town where you didn't have much, your children are not going to see the world the way you see the world. A lot of times growing up in the hood, uh, you developed a hustler's mentality. You learn to interact with people from all walks of life. You learn to do without, uh, whether that's the hood or in the country, an impoverished place. These two things are almost, uh, or these things are almost always ensure that no matter what life throws at you, you'll be able to bounce back. Unfortunately, the trauma and near misses you experience from poverty and growing up in the hood or growing up in the country and one of these poor southern towns isn't worth the risk. You know, that trauma associated with it is just not, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. So how do you school your sons on all the game and, and, and turn them into go-getters if they aren't challenged as youngsters. Uh, they've never had to hustle. They've never had to, they had never had to bust back from the setback. So what do you do to help them ensure that they'll be resilient enough to deal with life when it comes at them? Here's the thing, you gotta look, why'd you move out the hood in the first place? Because there's too much going on in there, too much trauma, too much risk. But see, then you also gotta remember that you shouldn't look at all those years that you spend in the hood as bad, you know, Oftentimes, living in those trying situations makes you sharp. It makes you observant. It makes you tough. You can handle the hard times. There's some benefits and there's some drawbacks of living in the hood. You decided that the drawbacks outweigh the benefits. So, of course, you moved out like so many other black men. You worked your way up. You got out the hood. But what we want to do is figure out how do we take the benefits from those situations that tested us, life and death situations for many of us. And so we want to take that and begin to capitalize. It. So, um, and also we want to challenge our, ch our children, especially our boy children, our girls too, but we want to challenge our children in similar ways so that they'll be able to adapt and overcome situations like we have. I have a few points I want to go over with you, but then the first, first thing I want to do is say, welcome everybody, thank you. Give a shout out to Tyson Milton, Excalibur, Ray Alexander, Durno, um, Deacon Dave, Fire for 2531. Thanks for the shout out to the good vibes of L. Marshall. If you appreciate me doing what we're doing here, if you guys have checked out my videos, uh, great. You know what we're doing. If you haven't already, go ahead and start checking them out, man. I hope you guys like what we're doing. Cash App is up, PayPal is up, and we're ready to go. Here's the thing if you have a black son growing up in middle America, growing up in the middle class, um, something they might not realize is that they are still black and that society will still treat them like they're black men, especially if they're boys, girls too, but especially boys. So it should be no surprise to them when they get that you're still black wake up call. Um, this often comes when dealing with administrators, dealing with police, and there are ways in which uh, you can counteract that. But here's the thing. You don't want your son to be surprised because they can go to these multiracial schools, multi-ethnic schools, and um, and have this uh, belief that everybody is equal and everybody's treating everybody else the same, and not be aware of the socioeconomic status and uh, uh, caste system that's set up, you know, in this world. You see, growing up in the hood, you are well aware of. Uh, <laughs> of, of where you are and where you position nine times out of 10, you're a white, you're, 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 all your teachers are white and you know, everybody in charge is white. And then at five o'clock or three 30, when the school bell rings, they get in their cars and they go back to the suburbs and you go home to the hood. You go home, you walk around the corner and take, take your school bus, bus back to the hood or to that country little town that you're from. And so you see early on, there's a difference between how I'm treated and how these people who are teaching me are treated. And so you begin to understand right off top that there is a difference and you don't need somebody. You don't need a black wake up call. If you're from the hood, if you're from a little country town, uh, like some of these little small towns, with black folks, you know, damn near. They look like they're still treated like we're uh, in segregation by some of these 
uh, police officers, you understand that you don't need a, 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 a you're still black wake up call. You see it happening all the time and all around you. But sometimes our children, when they grow up in these enclaves, these middle class enclaves, these upper middle class enclaves, uh, they'll be walking down the street or riding down the street and then some, you know, some old, uh, you know, <laughs> old some older person from the past will run up on them and call them a bad name as they're walking down the street. And it shocks them. You see what I'm saying? And so that sort of trauma can have an effect on the child if they're not ready for it. And so what you want to do is you want to go ahead and begin to prepare them for that. You know, you don't want that to be a surprise because you don't want something like that to throw them off. Look at the situation a few weeks back where the little Latina girl jumped on a little black boy whose mama was Latina, by the way. Daddy was black, a jazz musician from New York. Mama was black. A uh, 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 mama was uh, Latina. This Latina woman from Puerto Rico jumped on this boy, accusing him of taking her cell phone. Turns out the phone was actually uh, in, in, in possession of an Uber driver or the hotel. But either way, the little boy didn't have it. And so now he's traumatized by that. And I can tell you that growing up in South Central LA, something like that wouldn't have traumatized me. I would have been like, yeah, all right, whatever. You know, I'd have been able to shrug that off because for the most part, I'd had more traumatic things happen to me by that point than some woman accusing me of stealing her cell phone. You know, growing up in the hood, I was very aware of my surroundings. I knew what was going on. I knew where I was from. I knew what part of town I lived in. And I'd seen a whole lot. And so because of that, uh, it really wasn't a big deal for me to uh, adjust and deal with stuff like that. You know, it was just part it was part of it was it was part of growing up in the hood. So nothing was a shock dealing with the LAPD. So by the time you get dealing with the LAPD, when I come down here, when I came down to Texas or uh, Louisiana, my interactions with the police was all good. I knew where they came. I knew where they were coming from. They knew where I was coming from. This is before I became a lawyer when I was either a, just a student. Uh, working my way up through school to get to the position I'm in now as a trial lawyer here in Texas. But bottom line is, how do you teach your children to anticipate that? How do you teach? How do you inoculate your children to the in inevitable? You're still black. Wake up call. Well, you have to educate them. You have to not. You you don't want to cause them to be jaded but you don't want to just hide the truth from them. You have to explain to them that in this world that we live in, people unfortunately will judge you by the color of your skin. They will judge you uh, and it's unfortunate, but that's how the world is. And when a police officer sees you, he doesn't see a beautiful, wonderful young man that I know you to be. He sees a little black boy. He sees you just like they see those other black men uh, images that they put on television. They see your skin color and it's unfortunate, but this is a reality. So the best thing to do in my opinion is not, um, is not hide it from your children, you know, especially your sons because they're gonna catch the burn of it. Another thing you could do is to help soften the blow, especially dealing with the school situation is make your presence known at the school and on the field. And when I say on the field, I mean the football field, baseball court, I'm sorry, baseball field, basketball court, volleyball court, whatever. But, and then, as I said before, at the school, you wanna get to know the administrators. Any um, school that my sons go to, and they go to school here in a suburb outside of Houston, Texas, and even though Houston is still a multicultural kind of place, and the suburbs kind of reflective of that, the parents, black parents, you have to make your presence known at that school. You need to know the administrators ahead of time. You need to know the deans ahead of time. You need to know their school teachers ahead of time. You need to get involved so your children reap the benefit of knowing, uh, or your children reap the benefit of the teachers knowing that you know them, that you will show up to class, and that you're an involved parent. That's the way you do that. You see, you, you wanna make sure that the principal, I know my son's principal at his high school, at his middle school. I know the principal at their elementary school. When I get a chance to, when he enrolls in high school, I'm going to know the principal at, and the principal and all the deans at their school. I write letters. I go up to visit. Uh, I show up for school uh, parent teacher meetings. This is the type of stuff I do. This is the way I ensure that the parents, that the school knows who I am. And if there's a problem, I'm the parent that goes up there and deals with it. 
And I'm not going up there haughty and disrespectful, uh, but I do get involved. And what that does is it lets it give it puts the school on notice ahead of time that this this is an involved father. He's an involved parent. Uh, he's not going to be belligerent, but he is very active in his children's life. And what that causes the school to do is have to try to treat your children a little differently than they would treat somebody who they know doesn't have uh, a, a parent involved in their life. So that's something you can do. As far as a field, if your son is playing ball, and everybody who plays ball knows oftentimes there's a lot of politics involved in that. You know, whether it's a football, baseball, basketball, and if you want your children to get a fair shape, uh, you want to make sure you go up there and announce yourself, search yourself, get to know the coaches, get to know the professors. Uh, I'm sorry, get to know the coaches, uh, get to know whoever. Assert yourself. Don't just drop your kids off or go wait in the car. You get out there and you meet and greet. Meet the other parents. Let your presence be known. Let people see you with your children so they'll be able to associate you with your children. I'm not saying that that's going to mitigate all the effects of you know, them getting that you still black wake up call. But what it does is it begins to soften the blow. You know, it's going to happen. You know, this is how this society is set up. So what you have to do is be proactive in that and go ahead and get involved. Now, next up. Um, you want to educate your, as I said earlier, you want to educate your, sis, your your children on race and how it operates in this country, but you don't want to make them so jaded about race relations that they become hateful or closed-minded about other groups of people. So here's the thing. What I try to do is I try to instill pride in my sons about who they are, okay? I try to explain to them about their history. And our, when I talk to my sons about history, it doesn't just stop at slavery. You see what I mean? I explain to them race relations in this country, the good, and the bad, the origins, and, and, and you know where we're eventually headed. You see, I don't necessarily talk negatively about any group. I just state the facts and let them make their own decisions. I don't put any extras on. You see what I mean? And what I would do is I would do my very best to try to sterilize the argument. For instance, I will tell them slavery and uh, uh, the uh, the slave trade, which covered the entire Western Hemisphere and dates back to uh, you know 2,000 years ago almost with this Arab slave trade, was a horrible thing where Arabs and Europeans would come to Africa, get human beings, and ship them all across the known world, including the Western Hemisphere at this point. You know, and I said that those people involved, they started off. They did it for profit, we would like to think. But there were some other things involved. They liked the power, they probably were narcissists, they were tyrants. They did horrible things to people just for kicks sometimes. And so I say, this is why you don't want people to have control and power over you. This is why you want to be uh, your own boss. This is why you want to uh, be able to write your own destiny. This is why you want to be looking out for yourself and your family and your brothers. And this is why loyalty is very important. Unity is very important, especially amongst family. And so I will talk to them about that. I say, but look, this is what you got to think about. People will do what's in their own best interest. White people do what's in their own best interest. Asian people do what's in their own best interest. African, Black American, uh, Haitian, Dominican, Colombian. If they identify as a group, they're going to do what's in the benefit of that own group. So you can't get mad at people for doing what's in the benefit of their group. You can't get mad at them for doing for themselves. What you have to do is do for yourself. You see, and you doing for yourself and you unifying with your own people is going is the best thing you can do to try to counteract them doing what's in the best interest of their own people. If both groups are doing what's in the best interest of their own people, then those groups should counteract each other. That 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 the the uh, effect should be that one offsets the other. You see, and so I explained it to them in that terms in order to try to not cause them to be jaded against one group but think one group is more evil, more or bad off than another group. Yes, there are some bad, there are some atrocities that have taken place, but people oftentimes will do what's in their own best interest. Did they go too far? Hell yeah, they went too far. They, you know, as far as the slave trade, both the Arab and the European slave trade of African. Africans, they did horrible things, horrible atrocities that 
that that can never be amended for. You see, but this 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 is these are the facts. This is what we're dealing with, and they doing they were doing in their mind was in the, in their collective mind what was in the best interest of their group, and so we as blacks have to do what's in the best interest of our group to attack people, but not create those atrocities because that's not something that we want to do because that's not the people that we are. And what I do is I try to learn from that. It's a tricky situation. There's only so much you can do, but you want to speak the truth to your children. You want to tell them the truth, but you also don't want them to go out with a chip on their shoulder and be hateful because all that's going to do is undermine their ability to operate in this multicultural society. That we live in. Okay. You don't want to make them jaded. You don't want to make them hateful. You don't want to make them closed minded to other groups and other people. But what you do want to do, you, I mean, in other words, you don't want to create an enemy for them in your mind. You just want to point out this group, that group and that group did that. That's what they thought was in their best interest. What you need to do is get together with your group and do what's in your own best interest. So that's another subject. And we'll hit it a little bit later on down the road in this discussion. Uh, but moving to another topic, they need to your children who grew up in the suburbs are growing up in the suburbs, they need to be able to relate to their own black people, okay? That means they need to be able to relate to their own black people who are both from the hood and who are also country folk. And the reason I say country folk, because I went uh, to Grambling State University in North Louisiana, and uh, it was plenty of country folks around there. You see, the thing is, growing up in South Central LA, but being raised by a family who was a, a transplant from Mississippi, who got to Mississippi in the 1960s, me being born in 1970, I was surrounded by country folks from Mississippi, even though I was raised in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, so I could identify with my people. Yes, I was in the hood, but I had country people in the house. So when I got to Southern University, when I got to Grambling State University in North Louisiana in 1992, I was able to relate to the country folks. I was still down to earth. I didn't say stuff like y'all talk funny. I didn't think I was better than them. Uh, uh, let me see what else. I, I, I didn't down them for their eating habits or how they got down or what they did during the day. Um, you know, these are my people. I related to my people. Same thing with folks from the hood because I'm from the hood, even though I'm a lawyer. I still can relate to my people. Now, your children, on the other hand, if you grow up in the suburbs, they're going to be surrounded by people who speak proper for the most part, other middle class, upper middle class folks. And so when you take them to somewhere like, let's say I had a lot of friends from Gramlin. Uh, let's say they take somebody out. You, you from Gramlin, you take somebody to, to South, uh, South Park, Houston, Texas. Or, or, and, and you, you've been living in the suburbs of, uh, you know, Katy somewhere, or if you in uh, Los Angeles, you, you, you were born and raised in Compton or Long Beach, and uh, you live, you live out in Lancaster or somewhere like that, or you from, uh, you from New York, you from Harlem, you from Queens, you from the Bronx, and then, but you got yourself together and you live somewhere in New Jersey in the suburbs or something like that. Your children are not necessarily going to be able to identify with what you understood as, as far as what the world was like. And so the question is, are they going to be able to identify with their own people who uh, who grew up in the hood? You know, are they going to be able to identify with their own country folk who grew up in the country, you know, impoverished? And so how do we go about doing that? What do we go about? How do we go about making sure that our sons and our daughters are still down and still know how to relate to their own people. But well, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is take them around their, fam their family. Not to the point where some of those bad behaviors and those things begin to rub off on them, but definitely to the point where they know how to interact with their cousins and their families and, and whatnot, because family is important. And I think that, um, and, and, and I think that uh, the most important thing to do and teaching them how to interact with their people is to teach them early. You see what I mean? So they're comfortable around their own people. You don't want to put, you don't want a situation where uh, your children get out in the world and, and, you know, they're so suburbanized and they've been so isolated from their own people. They don't really know how to get that. They don't really know how to uh, uh, 
they, they don't really know how to associate with their own folks because then they're going to get left out. Those are the type of people that feel like, you know, they, they get to the point that they feel like, you know, black people don't like them. We've heard them before. Ah, blah, blah, blah. And then that's just weird at that point. You see what I mean? Then they feel left out. And here's a the reverse. Then they feel like they have to prove something. They always feel like they have to prove their blackness. It's like a light skinned girl trying to prove how down she is, you know, by being ghetto and loud. And, and and what she thinks is 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 tough or hood, so people don't mess with. Her. Same thing with your little sons. If you grow, you get your sons and your daughters, and they grow up in the suburbs, then they they start feeling like they need to prove that they're down, and they end up doing stuff that's totally out of character and totally not what you raise them to do. Or on the reverse side, they just totally shun that and they run clean to some other culture. So the best thing to do, in my opinion, is get them used. Get them used to dealing with their own people early on by allowing them to hang out with folks that are from uh, your family, uh, you know, that they can interact with on a regular basis. You know, they get, go meet their country cousins. They go meet their hood cousins sometimes. Not that you have to live there, but you need to do it on a regular basis so they do, so at least they learn how to interact. With now, at the point where they go home and, you know, you want to debrief them on stuff like that. but they need to learn how to interact with their own people. Let them join some basketball teams in the neighborhood, in your old neighborhood or some hood somewhere. Okay, let, it, let them join the football team, places where you know the brothers are going to be a, a, a Cub Scout, a Boy Scout troop in, in your old neighborhood. Or, or go to school in your old, old neighborhood. Go to church in your old neighborhood. Let them have some church functions happening over there where they can interact with themselves. If you're a Muslim, take them to the Black Muslim uh, Temple or something like that over in the hood. You see what I mean? These are the sort of things that will teach them how to interact with their own people so they won't be, you know, you know, they'll have they'll have an understanding of their own people because they're going to need that when they get old. Next up, um, there's a difference between being disappointed in black behavior in the community. We can do that. We can be disappointed in the community, but they still need to learn to love themselves as black men and women. And they still need to learn to uh and the way you do that is by learning about your people and the historical accomplishments, i.e. having knowledge yourself of your people. This is what I think is important. So, so here's the thing, man. Um, the black community, as far as I'm concerned, has been through a lot. Uh, if you watch the documentary called The 13th, regarding the 13th Amendment, if you, I just watched recently, I watched this uh, Netflix special called crack and it shows you how the black community was decimated if you go back to the 1950s 1955 you can see how much we've done you see up until that point and then it seems like there was an attack made on black unity on the black family be it feminism uh the loss of construction uh, loss of uh, uh these blue collar jobs were shipped overseas you can see how that devastated the black community. But the bottom line is there's still a rich history that needs to be discussed. You don't want your children to think that the current state of the black uh, community is all there is. You see, because that will cause for them to have adverse feelings about the black community. You need to tell them about all the things that black people created. And, and I'm not just talking about here in the United States, but you can start there. You can talk about the black universities and colleges. You can talk about, if they like sports, talk about all the NBA players who came out of historically black colleges run by black people, all the NFL players, all the baseball players, all the magnificent uh, minds, you know, like uh, Thurgood Marshall and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, George Washington Carver, um, a scientist and, 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 and a uh, a, a, a Supreme Court level judge lawyer who went to Lincoln University and Howard University uh, for law school. You can talk about these people, talk about what black people have done, what they contributed. They're into military. Talk about some of the great military uh, exploits of our uh, American uh, military servicemen and women here in the United States. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to tell you is to infuse in them historical facts. This may take some research on your part, but the bottom line is you have to do that. You have to arm them 
or what's going to happen is your children who are going to be separated from the black community are not going to have a great respect for the black community. So when they go out into the world, right, and they hear people saying things about the black community, they won't have any armor to protect their psyche and their mind from that. But if you give them something to fight back with, they will. And you don't have to stop here. And I, I want you not to stop in the United States as far as black history. You go take it back to the motherland. You tell them about the Songhai Empire. You tell them about the great uh, Zulu Empire under King Shaka. You tell them about Timbuktu. You tell, teach them about how Africans traversed the globe before the first white man or Asian man uh, entered into the planet. You tell them about that. You speak on that. Speak about the great, uh, if you have daughters, talk to them about the great uh, African queens who, who fought against slavery. Tell them history so that their mind is filled up with knowledge of self and their history so that you can't just tear them down. All right? That's that's uh, that's something that's important. You, and you do that because otherwise they'll be left disappointed at the black community and they will shun it and never want to claim it. But if you give them something to hold on to, you give them something to be proud of. That's what, what our people do. Talk about current events like uh, Deion Sanders taking over uh, Coach Prime, taking over the head coach job at Jackson State University. You know, something very interesting, you know, and something developing in their time. Talk about that. Talk about the accomplishments, whether you like their politics or not. Talk about the accomplishments of Michelle Obama, a woman from, you know, you know, the Southern I believe that, I don't know if she's from Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia. I don't know if she's from somewhere down there. But talk about her, you know, becoming a, a great lawyer and, you know, going through those Ivy League universities and, and, and end up being the first lady of the United States, you know, uh, in her in a lifetime that they can see. You know, talk to them about that so they can have pride in what black people created. Don't just dwell on nothing to fight back with, so to speak. OK. Uh, now we're 40 minutes in. We got 74 people in the uh, chat room. We only have 55 likes. Let's get the likes up. I want to get the likes up right now. Go ahead and uh, start getting the likes up right now. And since y'all not, I want to give a shout out to Creative Companion. Thank you so much for the super chat. In addition to that, Dink and Dave and Excalibur. Thank you, fellas, for the super chat. And I also want to give a shout out to Anwar Dunbar. Thank you for the $5 cash app, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. But look, and also Lance Jackson and Gordon Scott. I appreciate you guys. Uh, go ahead and get the likes up. We are getting the likes up. We have 62 likes. We got 70 people in here. Go ahead and get the likes up, y'all. And, 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 and just as a reminder, because I think y'all need a reminder, I'm going to go ahead and make a merch. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. Hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also, hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. The only time black men are allowed to speak is when it benefits others. So hey, this is your opportunity to speak. I wanna hear from you. And if you want to make this voice louder and clearer, then what you need to do is contribute to the Cash App, the PayPal, and the Super Chat. I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions. I appreciate it. Let's keep it going. Donate to the Super Chat. Donate to the PayPal. Donate to the Cash App. It's your contributions and your donations that are cause for this platform to grow. Let our voice be the voice, the preeminent voice in Black America. All right. So we are now back, and we're going to talk about the second half. So um, here's another thing, right? We, we basically said you don't want them to be surprised by their first you're still black wake up call. Uh, you don't want them to uh, you don't want to jade them, make them become jaded about race relations. You still want them to be open minded. You don't want them to be hateful about other groups and people, but you still want to educate them about race and, and whatnot. And in the light of this recent president that we've had, um, you know, it's important to have these conversations because it's a lot of people that can hold on to that and just have hate for everybody. I can see it happen, um, especially if something traumatic has happened to them. You also want them to be able to re relate to your country cousins and uh, people from the hood, you know, their own people. And you don't want them to become so disappointed in black behavior, black 
the black community without having, uh, you know, a countervailing balance and understanding the great historical things that we've done in this country. So you want to you want to create a balance in there. The next thing is, you don't want your children to be begging from for acceptance uh, from other cultures to the point that they allow themselves to be demeaned and belittled. Here's the thing: we all know a lot of black children who go to school in white neighborhoods, white communities, or communities of people from different ethnicities and different colors. And it's almost like some of our children, not all, but some of our children go out of their way to be accepted by these other groups. And what that tells me is, you know, there's some low self-esteem and there's a lack of pride in your own self. And so, um, you know, what you want to do is you want to make sure that your children know that that's not acceptable. You don't you don't expect them. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't be begging anybody for acceptance. OK, you should be friends with the people, whatever their color, whatever their race. They want to be friends with you. You shouldn't have to demean yourself or belittle yourself just to try to fit in. Fitting in is not that important. You want them to learn to set their own standards. You want them to learn to be their own be their own man or be their own woman and to stand up on their own two feet. Because if you bow down, if you start bowing down to the world that early on like that, that just develops a bad habit. It, it, it's a sign of what I call low self-esteem, you know, and, and self-hate, really a self-hate. Uh, that's my definition of self-hate and low self-esteem, which is just not something that you want your children to begin to inherit. So what you want to do is you want to explain to them, hey, look, people need to accept, put your best foot forward, be the best person you can be. If people can't accept you for that. You don't have to begin to try to uh, seek acceptance from other people who don't want you in that group, you know, and, and it's just a matter of, of self pride at that point. But you got to do that because remember, in the hood, you grow up for the most part, it's going to be a bunch of black and Latino people. And you know, some of the Latino people are. They understand they've absorbed black culture, especially if they come from places like Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and you guys who live in the Bronx and and and, and back up in uh uh you know in, in New York and Queens and Spanish Harlem, you know, they they get it. So you don't really have to change too much. Matter of fact, most people conform to you. You see what I'm saying? So so the thing is you you want to make sure that your children aren't up. It, you know, you got them in these white enclaves and, you know, and it's it's cool to be intelligent and speak, you know, standard English. I have nothing wrong with that. And I think that everybody should 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 uh, push for that. But the bottom line is for our children and get the best education you can. But you don't want them to feel like they have to demean themselves just to fit in. You see that that's a that's a very poor feeling. I would think you see what I'm saying. So so just run that. Think about that and 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 process that. Okay. That's something you should tell your children. When you see it happening, you talk to them about it. You take them, you pull them to the side, and you have a conversation about who they are. You teach them that knowledge of what they've accomplished as a as a group, what they've accomplished as, as a, a historically, as a people. You know, you tell them about their ancestry and slavery does not is not the beginning of African history. Okay, you tell them all about Africa. Like I said, Songhai, the, the, the colleges of the University of Timbuktu, all the accomplishments of Africans, who their heritage is. You got to talk to them about that. And, and that's why it's, it takes a, a uh, not just being a parent. Being a parent is not just, you know, pushing the kid out or donating the, the baby batter necessary for a woman to have one. It also requires being a good teacher and a good mentor. And so this is why I tell you, brothers, that you need to wait, you see and have children when you're 35, later, 40 years old, because you'll have some teaching children at that point. Now, here's another subject. This is a tricky one, right? <sighs> Dating girls of other races, which includes white, Hispanic, African, and Asian, and biracial, and girls from different cultures, and dating black girls who are suburban and those who are hood. <laughs> So, you know, we are living in a different, I grew up, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member of the X generation, okay? So I grew up in a time where we were pretty much still segregated, you see? Um, 
I grew up in South Central Los Angeles for the most part. I did go to school in the suburbs. I went from being um, a young man, being raised by a single mother in my extended family in South Central LA, to being to living in the suburbs outside of Houston, Texas called Pearland in the 1980s, which is pretty much all white, other than a few blacks here at that time. Because remember, people used to think Texas was about cowboys and hey, black people they get the hell out of here. They're going to New York, they're going to Atlanta, LA, whatever. But um, so when it's time to interact with little, you, your sons are going to like, they're going to like little girls, period. They're going to, I mean, you know, even when I was in Houston as a younger child, four or five years old, there was some cute little girls in there, a bunch of little white girls in there, you know? I remember it was some cute little girls. You know, I'm a little boy, they little girls. This is the 1980s, right? This is where we are not the, uh, it was still pretty racial back then, you know, in the 1980s, right? So your sons are going to be going through what I went through back then. Many of you grew up in, in white neighborhoods. Many of you grew up in black neighborhoods. You didn't have this issue. Your sons are going to be interacting with girls, little girls who are white. And I'm talking about your son specifically, because that seems to be where the problem is. All right. But your little girl, they could have the same issues, too. But your little your little boys, they're going to they're gonna be in classes with these little girls and these little suburban towns, these little white girls, these little Asian girls, little Latino girls. Uh, and then also African girls from Africa. Uh, and, uh, of course there's going to be some biracial girls and I added them in there because, you know, if a child is black, but they're biracial, depending on what their parent is teaching them, they're as culturally different as any other, those other races. So, so, so what do you do? What do you tell your son when he finds a little girl he don't like, uh, that he likes? You're going to have to explain to him, son. I want you to be open-minded and I want you to love whoever it is you're supposed to love and I support you 100%. But here's something I want you to think about. I want you to think about the fact that that little girl has a different set of parents than you do. And those parents might have a different set of beliefs on race relations than you do. How do you explain that to a five-year-old, right? How do you explain that to a six-year-old? See, I didn't have that problem in South Central LA because only girls around me was some Ishas and some Kaishas and some Taishas and some Keishas. And, you know, they knew where I was coming from. You see what I'm saying? And I knew where they were coming from because we lived in the same neighborhood. But your son invariably is going to like these little white girls. He's going to like these little Asian girls, these little Latino girls. And nine times out of 10, they're going to live in a little suburban area. So not only do you have a class differential, from what you're used to growing up in the hood, poor working class, but you're also gonna have a racial differential. Your sons are gonna be of a different class because if you worked hard and put yourself through school and you're making 45, 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars a year, your woman or whatever is making money, y'all live a different sort of class, uh, class, a style of life that your sons grew up in and your daughters too. So, you know, the thing is, when they're interacting with these little girls, you're going to have to explain to them not only racial, but also the, the social class system. I tell my sons this. I speak the truth. I say, historically speaking, son, when little white girls say you did something, it could be a dead out lie. But for the most part, she's going to receive the benefit of the doubt. Hell, all women are typically going to receive the benefit of the doubt. If a little girl of whatever ethnicity says that this little black boy did X, Y, Z to me, they're typically going to believe that girl, whether it's a black girl, a white girl, Asian girl, but specifically there are historical references I can point to. But little black girls, I'm sorry, little white girls say things that little black boys, uh, black men have done, and the little black boys get in trouble. So you have to speak on it. You have to speak the truth to your children. Now, again, you don't want your children to become jaded about race relations. You want the, you don't want them to just automatically think negative of one group of people. You don't want to do that because that just closes their mind off. Uh, you you keep it real with them, you know, but you don't want them to become jaded or hateful. You see what I mean? That's not what I preach in my house. I speak facts. I speak truth. 
I, I accept history for what it is, um, but it is what it is. You know, we have to speak the truth. And this guy bloated Kiki said, you shouldn't be racializing things to children. It's very simple. That's how problems, prejudices are taught. See, the problem with a philosophy like that is we just got a, tr a president, right? Who has invoked all this racial strife in the country. And we just had a bunch of white supremacist racists just try to invade the Capitol building. So how can this subject be avoided, uh, bloated Kiki? How do we do that? We have to talk about it. Otherwise, you're setting your children up for a big disappointment. Now, what I want to do is not cause my children to hate people from other ethnicities and other groups, but I do want them to be aware of what other people are thinking and what their positions are on race and life, and interactions, racial relationships. They need to know that. I think that's just good parenting. You just don't want to infuse that sort of hate. You don't want to pass hate down. You don't want to pass your own bias down, but you do want to speak the truth and let them understand and put it in context for them so they can understand what's going on. And if I have a son who happens to like a woman, let's say she's Latina, but I understand that there is a social uh, racial hierarchy in Latin culture. Now, I'm not saying it's you know, uh, all the way across the board. But what I am saying, I understand that it's present. And I understand that those white looking Latinos and those dark looking Latinos, they have a racial hierarchy. And when they see my son who is brown or one of my sons who is black or brown, there is going to be us, there is going to be some uh, some judgments made. There may be, there's some prejudice maybe associated with that. Not something that you can't overcome, but it's something that they need to be aware of. And as I said before, we have historical precedents where white women and white girls have said things in relation to what a white, a black man did or didn't do. And those black men, whether it's a, it's a lie or not, those black men end up incarcerated or buried somewhere uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in the side of a riverbank. You see, i.e. Emmett Till. So these are things that you have to make your children aware of. They have to be aware of the fact that these this is just the reality that they live in. African women, little African girls, if you're a black man, you have black children and your son may like an African girl or maybe your son is, you know, it, it's some differences. Our own African brothers, we see them a certain way, they see us a certain way. Same thing with West Indian people, same thing with, uh, you know, Caribbean blacks, South American blacks, we have, to be honest with our children. That doesn't mean that they create, can't create friendships. That doesn't mean that when they're age appropriate, they can't have relationships, but it's something you wanna prepare your children for. Now, here's another thing, and here's the crazy one. You black, your children are black, and I'm talking about black America. And so you live in the suburbs, you have these little, I'm talking about your sons. Now you got these little suburban sons or daughters, and your sons are going to have to deal with girls who are from the hood, right? Little black girls from the hood. <laughs> Can you imagine your little black son dealing with who's never interacted in, in, the, in the hood, who's not from the hood, dealing with a young sister who was filled up with ghetto gang, right? She's seen it all. She understands it all. Uh, and, and, and so in a situation like that, he's going to have to learn how to navigate one of these sisters, whether or not it's in a romantic relationship or they might be working together, you see, and he's going to have to understand how to interact with her. So my God, that's probably one of the most difficult things because she's going to be the one in charge of HR over there running the human resources department at his first job. So he's going to have to learn how to deal with her. And then heaven forbid, he likes a little suburban girl, but she like hood dudes, which is often the case. You know, girls like bad boys. So you know, this is something that you guys have to uh, anticipate when you're raising little black boys and little black girls in suburban areas. They're, 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 uh, and you want them to have those middle class values. You want them to value hard work, integrity, delay gratification. You definitely want that. But what I'm trying to say is you got to prepare your children. You can't just sit them out there and think, okay, everything's all right because they got high grades on the SAT and I moved out here to this nice area and I'm a member of the PTA. 
you still have to, to talk to your children and you still have to prepare them for the people and the types of people that they're going to interact with. Now, 58 minutes in. So, uh, you know, I want to make sure we get the likes up. You guys, if you appreciate what we're doing here, if you're enjoying the conversation, get the likes up. Uh, Bloated Kiki says, white women lie about white men too. And I know the same can be said about all races because ignorance and lies are a racial trait. Yeah, that's true, man. Uh, you know, white women do lie about uh, uh, white men. And, you know, but the thing is, you know, uh, in a society dominated uh, by white folks, you know, in that typically the judges, the juries, the prosecutor, you know, it's different than having a white woman lie about a black man because you know we already have these negative stereotypes associated with it so by the time you get in front of the judge or the prosecutor they look like oh yeah he must have did it look at it. and so and, and i appreciate bloated key I'm, I'm assuming kiki uh bloated kiki is a, is a white male yeah you're right man I, I i agree with you yeah white women lie hell women lie period black women lie black men all the damn time hell shit excuse me uh, women lie all the time, you know, but it's a different, it's a different kind of shape. Women, white women have a higher social status and than, than, than black men. It, 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 it's, it's, it's just far surpasses are. They're more likely to believe what she says than, than what he says. So it just puts us in a, a more compromised position, but I hear what you're saying. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I appreciate your input. You know, again, I tell people all the time, this page is dedicated for, for folks to hear what, uh, black men have to say, but I, I appreciate having other people's perspectives because what it does is it allows me to speak to people from different ethnic groups, different political persuasions, uh, and, and try to, uh, explain to them from the perspective of a black American man, where we're coming from. And so I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, somebody named Kevin Green says, I'm, I'm quite confused here. All right, but 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 either way. So um, this is the thing: your sons, your daughters, they're going to be dating people from other ethnic groups, and you want to prepare them for that. And I'm not saying it's going to be a, a, a super problem that can't be overcome. But what I'm saying is, be a good parent and prepare your children for what's coming. Do that. Be smart. Hopefully, they never run across some racist jerk, you know, of a dad or an uncle that, that treats your son or daughter in a way that causes for them to be jaded. Hopefully that never happens. But just in case, you, you want to be able to soften the blow by inoculating your children, by telling them what's out there, period. And that's it. And it could be so you can have a black or brown daughter, a black or brown son, and they could run across somebody from the Latin culture or the Asian culture who's bigger than a bias, period. Just as well, hell, like I said, you might run across somebody who's African who's biased towards black American, but you still want to be able to prepare yourself. Don't run from these topics is what I'm telling you. Speak the truth to your children, prepare them, but temper that by not causing them to be jaded about race relations. And, 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 and but you still want to be honest with, them, you know, and period. And that's just the best thing I can say. In the meantime, look, we're going to run a commercial. You guys appreciate what I'm doing here, man. Uh, contribute to the cash app. I'm trying to, do the best I can. And it's a tough subject. It's a lot to tackle. But we're talking about teaching your middle class sons and daughters, you know, who 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 are uh African or black, how to deal with stuff that they would otherwise learn how to deal with. Because see, growing up in the hood, man, you interact with all kinds of people from different social statuses, different classes. You learn how to deal with the police, you learn how to deal with tough situations. You know, I've been shot at before growing up. So you know how to think under pressure. Not that I would ever want anybody to have to deal with that. But what I'm saying is it cre it causes for you to be able to think on your feet. And a lot of these suburban kids, man, a lot, they just, they don't get it. You know, they just don't get it. They've never had, the toughest thing they do is come home and play video games with people. You know, unfortunately they don't have it. And so they've never been tested. So when they get out in the world and things get hard, they're not prepared to deal with it. It's no different than, Somebody like one of some of these these tough guys who grew up on these these farms or grew up in these backwoods of Appalachian Mountains. They have it hard. These are some of the toughest guys you you you're dealing with out there because they had it hard coming up, and it makes them uh, 
It makes them better men. These are the guys you want leading the military. These are the guys you want playing on your, your, your team, basketball, football, baseball, whatever. They're hard-nosed. They're tough-minded. This is what you want. And so I got that growing up in the hood. So when times get tough, I can handle it, you know, but your kids might not be able to. So we'll come right back in a minute. We're going to talk about teaching your children how to fight, when to fight, where to fight, why to fight. And uh, I'm going to give you some, some, some things you can do to kind of make your children's life a little bit more difficult. Just build character and resilience. But I'll be right back in a minute. Hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also, hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. All right, you guys, we're back. I want to give a shout out to, uh, let me see here. Shout out to Ray Alexander. Thank you so much, Ray. He says the ghetto game relevant in a fourth industrial digital economy. Game is always relevant, man. Your toughness, your mental toughness is always relevant. How you uh, respond to adversity is always tough. because Those are some of the things you learn growing up hard in the hood. Uh, creative Companion, thank you for everything you do here. Thank you so much, Creative Companion. Deacon Dave, he said it already. God bless you, Dennis. How do you become a mod? Just asking. I really don't have any. I got one mod, but that's it, man. Um, I don't know really if I need a mod. My page is not really that big, but um, I'll think about it. If you want to put in and be a mod, I'll let you know uh, what I need. So Excalibur said, never forget that Uncle D is a legend. Hey, man, if you guys like the music, you can find me on uh, IG. I'm not IG. You can find me on Amazon. You can find me on Apple find me pretty much everywhere just look up d period d-a-m-o-n-n that album is called coffee king international it's easy to find you can stream it for free if you guys like the music man i appreciate it you can also download it there's uh six albums out all together if you like the music that was called chinola it's a beautiful song about uh my travels from the dr to Colombia. uh part of it is in spanish also uh love for you guys to check out my latest album um, which you can find is called uh, Don Juan Carlos El Patron. These are the covers from my other albums. I think you guys will enjoy that stuff, man. Just check it out; it's available for you guys. But in the meantime, let's get back to uh, let's get back to what we're doing here. And shout out to uh, Gooper Tomasilo. Thank you so much. He's one of my Facebook friends. Uh, again, like I say, this page is. Uh, an opportunity for black men to speak. But here's the thing. I invite everybody to come listen to what black men have to say, you know, not just, and oftentimes what you guys realize is the messages that I deliver are not just solely uh, applicable to black men in our experience. It's applicable to all men. You see what I mean? And you guys can call it, but I know there's just not a whole lot of pages where black men have an opportunity to speak, but everybody's welcome to listen in. And oftentimes I'll have, guys, you know, guys from other ethnicities and groups, because you can learn a lot, men can learn a lot from each other, just becoming better men. So I appreciate everybody's participation, but here we go. Um, next up, and this is important to me, you know, teaching your children how to fight, when to fight, where to fight, and why to fight. Here's the thing, family. Um, a lot of us think just because we get out of the hood, um, 
you're safe. We think, okay, you take your children and you put them in these little enclaves full of other, uh, um, you know, middle class, upper middle class folks. There won't be any conflict. And, and then you know what? Then they end up, you know, in some sort of conflict that they're not ready for. Somebody pushes them, they get pushed down. And then you're appalled because your little island of peace has been upset and your children have to deal with the foolishness that you had to deal with bullies. There are bullies everywhere, you know, and there are different types of bullies. You got bullies who want to punch you and then you got bullies who want to belittle you. And you got to teach your children how to stand up to bullies. So you have to teach your children how to fight. Now, every fight is not necessarily a fist fight. But sometimes you have to resort to protecting yourself from those who would do physical violence to you, uh, cause you physical harm. Now, why is this appropriate for this? Because, you know, why are you you're teaching them? Because this is something you learned in the hood. If you grew up in the hood, if you were a country kid and you grew up, God darn it, somebody hit you with something if you're from the country. They might have threw a tire iron at you or a rock or a pile of horse manure or something at you. OK, and, and sparked up a conflict. If you're a kid from the city, yeah, you're going to have always have people in, in tight quarters like that. You know, people are stressed out. Kids are dealing with parents who aren't there. Parents are taking out their anger and frustration on kids. They wind those kids up and send them out into the community. And somebody's other some other kid is going to have to deal with that kid's frustration. So your kids have to learn how to fight. They also have to learn when to fight because every time it's not appropriate you, you, you can't if you have a school that has a no fighting policy in that school and your son or daughter is fighting in that school they're gonna get kicked out so that's not an appropriate place to fight period if they have a zero tolerance policy it's not an appropriate place to fight and so you have to teach them how to control themselves right where to fight OK, where to fight? You know what? I'm not going to fight you in front of the school principal. You know, if I got to fight, then OK, I'm not going to fight you when the cops show up. We knew this growing up in the hood. If it was going to fight, hey, let's go. The country people say, well, let's go back here behind the barn. Or, you know, let's go out into this field. The, the hood kids say, let's go to this alley or let's go to the side street. Where nobody can see if you really just want to get down. Why? You fight to defend your life. You fight to protect your family. You see what I mean? You, you fight for real reasons, not because somebody uh, uh, said something to you and, and you don't like it. They, they call you some silly name. Right. Either ignore them or call them some silly name back and go on about your business. But what you don't want to do is, 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 is spend your time fighting about things that don't eventually lead to anything productive or substantive. There's no gain in it. for you. Why waste your time? Now, I personally have enrolled my children in martial arts, different forms of martial arts, and that's taught them a tremendous amount about physical uh, and emotional self-control. They've learned the techniques to defend themselves, when to fight, how to fight. So I basically outsource that job to some professionals. But the bottom line is they learn those lessons and then I can take those lessons and teach them. So this is something that I had to learn in the hood the hard way. But see, the problem with growing up in the hood is sometimes you can get in a fight and that fight will lead to some sort of escalating violence. The next thing you got six or seven people knocking at your front door or somebody's big cousin trying to beat you up the next time they see you on the way from school. So, you know, yeah, there's a reason why we left the hood, but you know, that's one of those things you learn. You learn how to protect yourself, you learn how to defend yourself, you learn what's important, what's not. Some people don't get those lessons, you see? And so, some people learn those lessons and, and it went overboard, but this is just the reality of it. So these are some things, um, you know, you can't shelter your children all the time. You're making them weak. Now, lastly, before we go into the last segment where I invite people in to have a conversation with me is you want, we, we, we have made our children soft by not allowing them to deal with adversity. Many of us, we grew up climbing up trees, uh, my generation of children, uh, the X generation, we were the latchkey kids. What that means is we got a key to the house. We were allowed to walk home, sometimes blocks and blocks and blocks. And then, you know, when we got in the house, we just stayed there till parents came, right? 
Uh, some of you won't even let your kids play outside of the house without you keeping an eye on them. They call us helicopter parents. And I say us because I'm one of them, right? But darn it, my mom had to work, right? I, I you know, it's, what is she going to do? She can't come pick me up from school and drive. Look at the line of people picking up their kids from school these days. You got lines of parents picking up their kids at the high school, middle school. You got 13, 14 year old people, kids that parents don't trust them to walk home alone. These kids, and then they come home, what do they do? They play video games. They got their iPhones. They got all this going on. We're making a generation of very soft children. We are, that are not independent, that don't have any adversity in their life. And so when something hits them in the mouth, they're just going to fold up and cry and they'll end up living at home with you. So what you have to do, you know, us growing up in the hood, you grew up country, you grew up independent, whatever. You had adversity to deal with. You, you had life to deal with early on growing up in the crack era. I saw a lot and I had to reconcile that. And I, and I understood that life was hard very early. And sometimes I got hit in the mouth, both figuratively and literally. And I had to deal with that. Growing up in an area filled with, you know, infested gangs and crack and violence and racial strife, you know, inter intra-racial strife, interracial strife. There was a lot of adversity, bullies on top of the, the thing that, you know, growing up, just becoming a teenager, you know, having questions. You see, dealing with parents who didn't really know what they were doing, right? That's the type of adversity that has made us strong. And that's why we're here and so many of our friends are not. That's why we're successful and so many of our friends have failed. So you want your children to have to deal with things. You don't want to shelter them totally, you know? Yeah, you get a lot of scars. You experience a lot of trauma growing up in the hood, growing up poor. For some of you who immigrated here from other countries, you experience a lot of trauma in your home countries, a lot of a lot of poverty, you know, a lot of strife, war zones, some of you, you know. But that made you resilient. It built character, taught you to be humble, taught you to work your way up. Your kids don't have that. You're making hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year between you and your wife, you're taking nice vacations, you're driving around a luxury car. Your kids don't see the world from the same way you do. So what is going to happen? When they get hit in the mouth, what's going to happen when life kicks them in the stomach and they fall down? Are they going to get back up? Or are they going to stay down? What's their resilience level? These are the things. Do they have the character necessary to, to forge through the hard times? You don't know that, but more importantly, they don't know that because they've never been challenged. So you got to do things to challenge your children. It could be something as small. One thing I used to do to my sons as soon as they could learn how to walk, maybe one years old, one and a half years old. I would take them to this little hill around the corner at this little local park. Not too tall, but for a kid, it's tall. And I'd make them, I'd drop, I'd come, pick them up, I'd carry them a certain uh, distance, and then I'd drop them right there. They're far enough away from their mama and their car. The only person they can follow is me. And so they would have to walk up that little hill. I've done that to all three of my boys at a young age. They got to walk up that hill. And they got they crying and they're walking, but I just set the precedent right there. This is life is hard. Life is a walk up a hill. And I don't care if you're one years old, little man. You're gonna have to deal with this adversity. Might as well go ahead and start young. Since that point, you know, I put my sons, I believe my oldest son, he started uh Kempo Karai or Kung Fu at five years old. I remember one day his three-year-old brother and I were sitting over at the side uh, of the class. And it was uh, his first time sparring and uh, he got kicked in the stomach. I didn't make any noise. I didn't say anything. I just watched him fold up. He took a knee and then he got back up and he kept fighting. The only thing he heard from me say, hey, daddy's watching. And your little brother's watching. He looked over slightly like that and he got back up and he kept fighting. Adversity. It's going to kick you in the stomach. Are you going to get back up? There are going to be hills and mountains for you to climb. Are you going to be able to traverse those mountains? Are you going to be able to climb those hills? Are you going to be able to deal with that? 
because that's going to determine your character and your character is what's going to determine your longevity in this world. So don't shelter your children so, to the point that you, you handicap them. You can't hide them from the world, uh, folks. You're not going to be here forever. I know you escaped the hood. Many of you are still suffering from trauma. Many of you who came from third world countries, you're still suffering from trauma. You don't want your children to suffer through what you suffered. through. But I'm telling you that they need that adversity because it's going to build character and it's going to make them strong. So, um, you know, I hope you guys appreciate what I'm doing here. I'm going to open up the chat lines. we got a little time to talk here. Uh, go ahead and contribute to the super chat and the cash app. Uh, but let's talk about, um, you know, why teaching middle class. Uh, why teaching your middle class son ghetto game is crucial to his understanding. Right. That's what yeah, I got you guys with that. Uh, with that uh, ghetto game, that probably no. Oh, what did you talk about today? Damn it! I got you guys with that major look, but uh, the link is in the chat room. You guys want to join in? Come on in. I appreciate you guys coming on in. Uh, join the conversation. In the meantime, Catalina Castillo says, "Esa canción me tiene muerta de la risa. Usted mucho bien. Okay, whatever. I appreciate what you're saying. I guess." But uh, either way, if you appreciate what I'm doing here, if you like what's going on, go ahead and contribute to the Super Chat, contribute to the Cash App. In the meantime, I'm going to run a commercial. Hey, join in the link. If you want to talk, let's talk. Come on in. Let's have this conversation. I am going to run a few commercials. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions to keep this thing going. Thanks. Hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also, hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. The only time black men are allowed to speak is when it benefits others. So hey, this is your opportunity to speak. I want to hear from you. And if you want to make this voice louder and clearer, then what you need to do is contribute to the Cash App, the PayPal, and the Super Chat. I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions. I appreciate it. Let's keep it going. Donate to the Super Chat. Donate to the PayPal. Donate to the Cash App. It's your contributions and your donations that are cause for this platform to grow. Let our voice be the voice, the preeminent voice in Black America. My name is Stephanie, and these are my two adorable and handsome sons. And that is my ex-husband, attorney Dennis Sperling. He practices personal injury law and will be more than happy to help you with claims arising from automobile accidents. He doesn't get paid unless you get paid. And as we first wives know, the more our ex-husbands get paid, the more we get paid. So let me help him help you. Call Mr. Mm -hmm. Sperling at 713-229-0770. <laughs> Call my dad, dad, dad. All right, and I'm back. So look, if you guys want to join in this conversation, come on in. I want to talk to some, some folks, especially those of you all who have children and, you know, you grew up poor, you grew up, you're an immigrant. You came from this country from somewhere else. Life is tough for you. And uh, join the conversation. And what you want to do is you want to, Emulate some of those tough times you had to build character. You want your children to take the good stuff about your character that you learned growing up, growing up in the hood, but you don't know quite how to teach them that. So go ahead and join the conversation. In the meantime, we are going to chop it up with Malika. What's up, bro? How you doing, man? What do you think about the, the conversation today, the eight points that I brought up? What are your thoughts on that? You're going to get mad at me, brother. I just came in on the tail end, man. I just came in about oh, five minutes ago. I was busy. I, I sit up <laughs> for days sometimes coming up with these some coming up with these points. Right. And then here you come. Right. And keep <laughs> me out of the response that I feel like I deserve. man. But that's all right, bro. Well, based on what you got, man, what do you think about what you heard today? Is it helpful? Yes, most definitely. Definitely, man. Um. You are definitely picture perfect of a brother who struggled, come from South Central LA, you know, mm. gang territory, the middle of the crack era. You know, you and I both Gen Xers, man. Yeah. 
Um, just what you've done to pull yourself up by your proverbial bootstraps and provide a good life for yourself first, then you provide it for your sons. Yeah, um, boys right there, but go ahead, go ahead, but that's two up. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't have any children, but I'll go on what my grandfather did for me and did for his family. Uh, my grandfather was a blue collar man. Mm-hmm. He was a spot welder for 35 years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, back in 1963, 64, they bought a home, my grandparents. Now, back right. then, that was very big for black people to get a home and to own a home. Yeah, that's a lot of history for somebody to understand. If you're a black person coming up between late 50s into early 60s and you're able to own a home, not rent a home, but own one. Yeah, Um, they they weren't giving out loans back then to black folks. They weren't. But the thing was, my grandfather had a career of being Mm -hmm. a spot welder, a blue collar man, Um, raised five kids and one grandchild. And I'm the one grandchild. my grandfather, my only my only my aunt and my my grandmother told me the struggle that my grandfather came from. My grandfather yeah. and his two sisters came up from Florida to meet up with their father here in Philadelphia, and he struggled. My grandfather only had eleventh uh, grade education. Yeah. Um, my grandfather couldn't take it, understanding me being a spoiled kid and just being not taking things seriously and taking things for granted. My grandfather used to say, did women ruin you, boy? Meaning that my aunts and my mom and my grandma make, spoiled make you. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then he said, he said, you're going to have to learn. You're yeah. going to have to learn. Now, my grandfather wasn't a man of real emotion, but when mm-hmm. I became a police officer and I have a picture, like, you know, you have that, like that family picture where you, everything, when you get there, he had his hand on my shoulder. And he would look, he gave me a look after I became a police officer. It was just like a look. And I would see him and I would say, hey, Pop, what's up? He's like, hey, man, how you doing? And he had this look of respect and he's like, okay, now you're doing it. Now you're doing it. Right. Yeah. Now you're doing it right. And I can, and that's when, you know, when you get older as a man and you start doing stuff and you start doing things responsibly. And he asked me, well, how's work? How are things going on? How is your apartment? I said, it's all right. And he says, how's your, how's your car? He said, you keeping up with your car? I said, yeah, I'm doing right. And he says, keep up on your car, man. What's going on? You need this. And I remember when he had gotten sick, my grandmother had passed away. Okay. Uh, they had passed away a year apart. Now my mm-hmm. grandmother had passed away, but then here's where the ties turn when you got to help out your elders. Right. I remember the certain things that he used to tell me and used to teach me, he says, go here, do here, do that. And my grandfather was one of them old dudes. He was a hustler, not a hustler like we know, but a hustler. He was a dude that would go to the number house, run numbers, hang with old dudes, uh, play right. poker, you know, you know, play bets on the horses. He was just that. He was just one of the street dudes. But yeah. he was a man that always there for his family. And that's one thing that I understood. OK. And he allotted a working class lifestyle for me, my mom and my aunts and uncles and my grandmother. And I never forgot that. And I never, and I never understood strong work ethic until I got out on my own and understood what he was trying to instill in me. Yeah. Um, the The one thing that I love that I see, and it's a very beautiful thing, which you're instilling with your son by taking them to martial arts class is to instill in them discipline and work yeah. and hard work. And I like I love when you had when your son you said, well, what does hard work mean to you? And your youngest son said it pays off. And I was like, yeah. wow. Mm-hmm. And that was just something that was just how the way you're teaching them. And that's yeah. just the beautiful thing that's there. Um and that's the best thing I think we can teach the youth and our and especially children that are ours that Okay, I got this, but here's how the way I got this. Right. This, this didn't fall out of the sky. I had to work hard for this son. I had and also showing them paved ways. I love when you showed your son um the picture of um, Thurgood Marshall and you're speaking uh, yeah. to him. Mm-hmm. And you're not saying he's not just my ancestor, he's yours. Right, right. And he paved the way 
not just for me, but he paved the way for you. Yeah. And that's just the beautiful thing that 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 you're showing, like, you know, you know, it wasn't just me. This this doesn't happen by osmosis, son. This this, mm -hmm. this man did it. You know, he was a black lawyer. <laughs> And right. he went through struggle and he was the first black Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what the crazy stuff that he went through. Yeah, man. You know, the thing is, uh, like a man, um, like I, I think we, we do our children a disservice by shel over sheltering them or over protecting them and not mm -hmm. letting them know what the world is really about. If we only show them the good or try to shelter them from the bad, then they won't truly appreciate the good. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Like definitely. I tell my children about racism and bigotry and prejudice. So then when they meet someone who is genuinely into them or likes them for who they are, they can truly appreciate that person and truly mm -hmm. respect that person. Because if the status quo was you like me no matter what, or you like me, you know, whatever my color, my religion, my race, that's nothing. But if somebody likes you and somebody appreciates you and they're genuinely, genuinely your friend, despite what they've been taught or despite the messages that society has brought to them, then that's probably somebody that's a genuine friend you won't keep around. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? Like early on in the conversation, I talked about not begging for acceptance into others' cultures and and, and 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 to the point where they allow themselves to be demeaned and belittled. I know you know a lot of black cops, they want to be accepted by white cops so bad that they'll mm -hmm. just go along with the jokes and you know they'll they'll be the, the whipping boy, you know. They just want to go along. I know cops like that, I know lawyers like that, I know district attorneys like that. They want to get in where they fit in, you know, thinking that if I allow them to belittle me and my culture. That'll make me more acceptable to them. I don't want my children to feel like that. I want them to be confident in who they are as young black men, confident about uh, their ancestry, where they came from, our people as a group, our African ancestry. You know, and so that's why, you know, I think it was important to have this conversation. And in addition to that, you know, in my community, there's a, you know, it's, it's very multiracial. You know, mm -hmm. like Houston is the most diverse city in America, even more so than New York. It's not like South Central LA where you got black girls and then you got Hispanic girls. But for the most part, the Hispanic girls stuck with themselves. So all you really have is black girls to deal with. You have one choice. If you was going on a date, it was going to be with her. And especially coming up in the Generation X generation, where you had to, you had to keep it real. You said to me with a sister, else you even sold out. So uh, matter of fact, if your girl was too light skinned, you sold out. You oh yeah. <laughs> me and so, you be having fights, man. We be like, oh, why are you with that yellow dude? Oh, oh. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, man. Yeah, man. So uh, you know, I, I, I explained to him about the conversations you need to have with your sons about dating girls from other races, being white, Hispanic, African girls, Asian girls, and even biracial girls and, and girls uh -huh. from different cultures. And here's another thing: if you're a suburban kid and you dating a girl from the hood. A black girl from the hood, even ah, oh, that's a that's a that's a trip in itself. You see what uh -huh. I mean? And hell, even trying to date black girls who are suburban girls, you it's man, you miss the conversation, man. You you out here playing in these streets, man. You ain't you ain't real in these streets, brother. You ain't real in these YouTube streets, man. I'm I'm dedicated to the cause, bro. But uh, go bro. ahead and wrap this up, man. We gonna uh, <laughs> we gonna get up out of here. We had men in thirty. You gonna disrespect me and tell me wrap up the show? You, wow, you that, that hurt. Up, man, you late. You done came late, man. I sat here and pondered on this for about the past four or five days. I had all these talking points, and you just showed up late and took over the show. So go ahead and finish taking over the show. I'm gonna make you big and me small. Go ahead. Let's <laughs> have a go. You man. Go ahead. Spoken like a true attorney. <laughs> um. I have nothing really to say, man, but you know, it's the truth. Um, as men, especially black men, we, we have to show our sons and even our daughters both yeah. sides of both sides of the fence. Yeah. And yeah. especially if you came from a certain area or you grew up in a certain area, like how the way we were talking last night about, you know, when you start making a certain amount of money, and if you came from poor or working class now you worked up to middle class and if you even go farther you know your son is your son is born into 
your sons are born into a certain ways. Like you say, your son ain't used, your sons ain't used to you driving your first car. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know, this is the car they grew up riding around. Yeah. Right there. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's when like, they took their vacations right there. That that's that's where they took their vacation. This this where I'm from. You see what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. Like you, you know? said, your son said, Dad, there's no grass. The streets are small. They ain't used yeah. to that. This is my old neighborhood. There's look at no grass. They went from this is what they used to. And this was look at that. But the beautiful that. thing is that you're telling that. them, you're <laughs> telling them, hey, this is where I grew up. Yeah. This is where I had to deal with. And you start telling them, like, you know what the funny thing is, man? Some of these kids today, they hear about the crack era, but they don't know about the crack era. Man, and when uh, you tell, and when you tell them for guys like us that survived that. Right. Like um, you know, the um the movie Lean On Me, right? Yeah. From Morgan Freeman. I went mm -hmm. to a high school like that. Now, mm -hmm. when I tell young people like that, they look at me like, wow, really? I said, I graduated before they start putting metal detectors in schools. Oh, wow. when, I first, when I first saw marijuana and I first saw crack, I was in high school. They used to sell it out of the bathroom. You know, when you go to the bathroom, you got to get a hall pass to walk. Yeah. I remember that. I, I remember seeing drug dealers driving up in BMWs. Wow. There was one drug dealer named Anthony. He um, would sell drugs and he brought his Rottweiler dog to school. Mm -hmm. And he had one of them gold rope chains around the neck. Yeah. I was, I remember seeing dudes getting high in the back of the class. And I'm a square. Yeah. And I grew and that school was in North Philadelphia. My man, now, I, I'm sorry, I got a guy. He said, Thundercat, how did you make it without white supremacy stopping you? Let me let me tell you something, brother. There's always going to be some sort of system or some sort of set of hurdles in your way. If if you were Chinese, right, and this was a thousand years ago, you were having to deal with the, the Hun Dynasty, exactly, the Qing Dynasty. There's always a system of adversity set up in your way. What you have to do is you have to find a way to succeed in that system. You have to overcome it, go around it, go through it, go under it. You have to find a way. There's always going to be a system in charge. Even when we ruled the world as blacks, right? There was still a system. There was still a hierarchy in place, whether it was a, uh, whether like it is now, a color barrier or back then a royalty. You couldn't be king or couldn't be pharaoh because you wasn't born into it. So you, you're going to be a slave or servant or something like that. There's always a system set up. You see what I mean? And you have to figure out a way to get around it. So yeah, the, the 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 there's a system in place called white supremacy racism, where those who classify themselves as white give each other a hand up, a help out. You see what I mean? There was back in the day, there was another system. There was a there was a, a the, the kings and the queens of different countries and nations. You know, you were a serf, you were a servant, you were a slave, you were conquered. There's always something you're going to have to deal with. And it's part of the human experience. If you read your Holy Bible, right? I know you guys, a lot of you guys, I ain't reading that, man. That's the way I get it. I get it. But it's the story of the human condition. You see what I mean? And if you read it for understanding, it will teach you a lot. If you don't like the Bible, read ancient stories about people. And you'll see two, three thousand years ago, they were dealing with the same stuff you're dealing with now. White supremacy racism is only 500 years old. Uh -huh. We have at least 80,000 years of black history on this planet, African history. And there's always a system set up to keep you down, keep you in place, keep some at the top and, and most at the bottom. You see? And so you have to figure out a way to deal with that. How did I deal with it? How did I deal with the system set up to purposely target black men and put us in jail? Well, I didn't fall for the most obvious traps, right? I didn't, I didn't get on drugs early on. I didn't commit crimes. I wrote about it in my three books. I wish people would buy it. I wouldn't have to explain myself to people, but you can get these books on Amazon under Dennis Sperling, and it gives you a complete understanding of what I had to do to get to where I am. But for the most part, it involves a lot of hard work. It involves a lot of prayers and it involves a lot of sacrifice. Uh, it involves me taking risk, like the risk of taking my butt from South Central L.A. to Louisiana to go to school. Uh, me taking a chance on myself, starting my own uh, uh, law firm, 
after Hurricane Katrina calls for me to lose my job at the law firm I was working for as a young associate in New Orleans. Um, but it's been ups and downs, bro. You know what I'm saying? But what I'm trying to tell y'all, man, is, is, is don't use white supremacy racism. Don't use your height. Don't use your color. Don't use your age. Don't use any of that stuff, your handicap status, as, as, as a reason to, to quit fighting. You see what I mean? You fight. You fight, you fight, and you fight, and you die if you have to for what you believe in. And when you are willing to put it all on the line, when you are, when you, when you decide in your mind that you rather die than quit, when you rather die than lose, then you'll start winning or you'll die trying. You see what I'm saying? And that's the mentality that you have to deal with when you're dealing with an oppressive system that targets you because of the color of your skin or, or your religion or your ethnicity or your ethnic group. You got to be willing to put it all out on the line. But other than that, man, we just talking about building up the youth. I appreciate everybody for coming in. I appreciate my life once again having you back. And, uh, man, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, all the contributions that come through. So that said, man, Malika, man, we're going to go ahead and get up out of here, man. I appreciate you once again, bro. We'll talk to you later on tonight when we do our second broadcast of the evening. And uh, this is Dennis Sperl, also known as Uncle D, and I'm out. Thank you.